Hey, happy Friday, everybody. My name is Mark Medeiros. I am the Senior Manager of Community Engagement for Peninsula Open Space Trust. And we wanna welcome you to today's program, Uncovering Ships and Secrets at Pigeon Point in partnership with California State Parks. We hope you're all doing very well today. So first, I'd like to acknowledge the native people whose territories we are joining from today. I'd like to recognize the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and the Amamutsun tribal band whose territories are nearest to post operating area. But wherever you are, please pause and acknowledge the native people whose territories you are joining from. Remember that the next step is to learn more about these people, um, their organizations, their current goals and causes and learn how you could support them directly. So we're gonna be talking about Pigeon Point today, which I believe many of you have visited. Um, and this is part of the core area that POST has worked to protect since our founding in 1977. We've protected over 80,000 acres of open space uh, in San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Northern Santa Cruz counties at this point in our history. And Pigeon Point is right at the heart of it. So we're gonna show you this context map zooming in on the San Mateo coast and you can see there Pigeon Point on the left with a little star. And this map is showing all protected lands in the area with post protected lands highlighted in dark green. Um, so we have been working in this area for a long time. Um, we in early 2000, the early 2000s, we embarked on a $200 million fundraising campaign called Saving the Endangered Coast through which we protected many of the coastal lands you see on this map and beyond. And our conservation work in this area continues today. We've been working to increase public access to open spaces and coastal lands through our public access program. An example of this is helping to advance the San Mateo County portion of the California Coastal Trail, which is an effort to create a continuous public trail along California's coast from Oregon to Mexico covering 1200 miles through 15 counties. And we've done a lot of work, made a lot of great progress on the San Mateo County portion of this trail. We've also helped to expand public open spaces and parks throughout the area, such as Butano State Park and Nuevo State Park and many others. And another area of post work in this area is protecting farm and ranch land throughout the region through post farmland program. There's a great variety of local farms and ranches working on post protected lands in this area. And we definitely encourage you to learn more and support your local farms. So a couple of things we wanted to share about the Pigeon Point area, some tips for you. If you're ever traveling near Pigeon Point, you might, you might like to stop at Wilbur's Watch this is just south of Pigeon Point, and it's a one mile out and back trail located on post Cloverdale Coastal Ranches. As you can see here, it provides you an incredible view of Pigeon Point. And the trail is dedicated to Colburn Wilbur, a retired executive director of the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, which is a very important and long-term partner in posts conservation work. And Colburn Wilbur worked to protect thousands of acres of open space in California. And next, a little bit about post involvement at Pigeon Point. The three acre site immediately in front of Pigeon Point Lighthouse is called Whaler's Cove, and it's aptly named, as you'll see from today's presentation. Post purchased the land in 2000 to protect it from private development that would have blocked views and prevented public access. In 2005, we then transferred the land to California State Parks for permanent protection. And so now California State Parks manages this beautiful place for you and for future generations. If you're ever visiting, you might stop by the council circle. It's a beautiful seating area overlooking the cove that commemorates donors to post saving the endangered coast campaign and you can also walk Mel's Lane. It's a quarter mile segment of the California Coastal Trail that runs south from Pigeon Point around Whaler's Cove. And Melvin Lane was a devoted conservationist, served as the first chairman of the California Coastal Commission and also co-founded POST. 
So that's providing you some context. Of course, all this work is possible thanks to the thousands of people and institutions who are part of Post Donor Community. So as usual, we want to say thank you to all of you, many of whom are listening today. You're absolutely the reason that this work is possible. And of course, thank you to our beloved California State Parks, which manages Pigeon Point and in Nuevo and many surrounding lands, as many as well as many, many more state parks throughout California. The mission of California State Parks is to provide for the health, inspiration, and education of the people of California by helping to preserve the state's extraordinary biological diversity, protecting its most valued natural and cultural resources, and creating opportunities for high quality outdoor recreation. So today we're happy to welcome Richard Fitzgerald, the director of the State Archaeological Collections Research Facility for California State Parks. Richard is born and raised in the Bay Area and holds a Master's of Archaeology from San Jose State University. In the past 30 years, Richard has worked for the National Park Service in Yosemite, Redwood National Park, Caltrans in the Bay Area, the U.S. Forest Service on the Mendocino National Forest, the Anthropology Lab at Sonoma State, many private firms, and has experience in Denmark, France, Mexico, Peru, and New Mexico. And so Richard served as the project manager for the Central Coast Maritime Landscape Investigation, which is part of the um, topic that we're gonna be discussing today. Very excited to hear from him. And with that, I'm gonna welcome Richard to the program. Hey, hey. Welcome, Richard, how are you doing today? Okay. <laughs> Very good. We're really excited to host you. Um, thanks for making the time. And um, I we got to chat a little bit uh, in advance here. I wanted to ask you, you know, um, everybody heard your your credentials there and your history a little bit, but right. can you share why you what inspired you to get involved in archaeology? And I know this project has some personal significance to you. Yeah. Um, well, the first question I would answer that I, when I was in an undergraduate uh, school uh, at San Francisco State, uh, I took um, some archaeology classes, and that's what really got me started, I guess. Um, however, what I took was uh, focused on Mesoamerican archaeology and Peruvian archaeology, so that was my first blush with, with archaeology. Um, and led to my some of my travels uh, in Central America. But later on, I wound up doing a field school in New Mexico and where I was introduced to North American archaeology. And from that point forward, uh, that's where I, you know, focused my energies. And uh, ultimately, uh, even though uh, the Southwest is such a great place to work in, it, it was fabulous cultures to, to look at. Uh, I wound up back in California, where I guess I belong, you know, in my home, and uh, have had a, a, a fairly successful career, you know, uh, as you mentioned, for different different agencies, but, but uh, the longest term it's been with state parks, which I've been with since 2004. Wonderful. And and so, yeah, this, this project, talking about Pigeon Point and whatnot, I, I know this... Um, carries a little bit of personal significance and um, right. do you want to share anything about that? Sure, yeah, um, well, despite my uh, uh, very Irish last name, um, I'm actually half Portuguese as well. My, my mother was uh, full-blooded Portuguese and uh, her uh, uh, father was from the Azores, so you're gonna hear a lot about the Azores today in my presentation. And so for me, this is kind of a personal thing because uh, it sort of tracks, you know, my family history in some ways, you know, this connection between the Azores and California. And um, I've yet to, I've been to Portugal, but I've yet to uh, visit to the Azores. So I can hardly wait till I, I get to go and, you know, visit the land of my ancestors, if you will. That That's wonderful. And, um you know, we we reached out because we wanted to discuss archaeology and the history of of ships and and whaling at Pigeon Point. And um, my parents are Portuguese immigrants too, and I hadn't it hadn't even occurred to me that 
we would be discussing whaling history and by extension, you know, the history of Portuguese folks in, uh, in Pescadero and on the coast in California. So I'm excited too right. today. And, um, and so again, thank you for joining us. Um, I know you have a lot of information to cover. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you uh, and you could just okay. uh, get your slides ready there, Richard, and I'll let you know when they're all loaded up. And of course, uh, welcome to everybody who's watching. We got a lot of great comments coming in already and um, try to make sure to ask some questions. We'll try to save some time for questions at the end. So, so Richard, your, your PowerPoint is loaded up now and you're all ready to go. Okay, well, well if you can see the first slide, I'll, I'll start off. Yep. So in uh, 2019, archeologists from California State Parks and the University of California, Berkeley conducted field work to document the submerged and terrestrial archeological remains of the shore whaling industry and other maritime related industries along the San Mateo Santa Cruz coast during the mid to late 19th century. This presentation will review the rise and decline of this industry and the results of some of our surveys. In my first slide here, I just wanted to kind of backtrack a little bit and let the audience know that this particular project I'm talking about today was a second project, uh, which was this collaboration with the uh, NOAA, the uh, National Marine, uh, or the NOAA and their, their office of the National Marine Sanctuary. Um, the first project, as you see here, uh, resulted in this report um, that is about to be published. And this was a, a project along the Sonoma coast. And much of what I'm gonna talk about today uh, relates to this original project. So I thought I'd go through this a little bit first. This is just a slide of uh, from the um, the Santa Rosa uh, Daily Democrat of our uh, project uh, back in 2016. And what we were doing here is examining the Sonoma coastline um, for uh, what I'm gonna talk about here is the, these dog hole ports, which is this particular slice of maritime history in California. Um, as it turns out, we um, have a rich maritime history um, in California that goes beyond just you know what we think about in terms of the people coming to California during the gold rush and all that entails. What we were able to document uh, along the Sonoma coast is a series of ports that were integral to the, uh, the, develop, the economic development of California at the beginning of the gold rush. And what you see here is just some, some shots from this um, project. Uh, on the uh, top left is something I'm gonna talk about at some length uh, later on. That is a uh, trough or wire chute. I'm not sure which type exactly, but these were the apparatus that were built to transport goods, in this case, mostly lumber or wood products to waiting schooners that would did transport them to San Francisco and actually to ports all, all the way around the world. This particular um, slide or that picture is at Fort Ross at Fort Ross Cove. Uh, below that is the uh, the wreck of the Pomona. And I'm, I'm not gonna get into shipwrecks too much today, but I thought I, this is such a dramatic picture. I'd share this. This, this occurred on March 17th, uh, uh, 1908. And fortunately no lives were lost uh, due to the, the, the help of the Call family, which you see uh, some of the members of in the middle of the picture there. And then on the far right is the publication, which we're trying to get finished here. We're just waiting for uh, a sign off from NOAA so we can get it published. And this is part of our parks publication series. So this is just a map of all the different areas that we looked at for the Sonoma Coast project. Um, as you can see, there's, there's quite a number of places that we uh, were uh, examining. And here's a better shot. So with the names associated with the different ports that we looked at, each one of those yellow push pins represents an area that we, we examined from, uh, from the, the land, 
but it also we also had in conjunction with NOAA uh, divers, uh, and we had the use of their uh, their diving platform, which was a beautiful uh, ship. And so the, the, there was a, a certain amount of underwater investigation going on in this project as well. So now I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, this whole idea about the dog hole port. Um, this particular slide is of uh, Gerstle Cove, which is in Salt Point State Park. And uh, amazingly enough, we found remnants of all these elements that you can see in this picture, uh, except for the ship, of course. But we found hardware that was associated with all, all that shoot and this, this delivery system. Um, as, as you can read, uh, the whole thing about dog hole ports, uh, they were called such because they were so small and so narrow that they were barely large enough for a dog to turn around in. And that's, 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 that's the one story. The other story is that um, the captains of the ships <clears throat> that came to, to call on these ports could tell where they were by on a, on a particular foggy day by the uh, barking of, of, of a dog at a particular spot. This is at Timber Cove, <clears throat> which is um, just uh, north of Fort Ross. So of course, you know, the impetus of this maritime industry was really, you know, the gold rush, which, you know, as we all know, had a dramatic uh, impact on California. And, you know, and in, in, in many, you know, uh, bad ways, of course, but, but this really um, was the impetus for this maritime tradition of the dog hole ports. And of course, as you know, this was a, a fueled by the tremendous growth of the city of San Francisco. And this is just an old painting and you can see all the ships out at, in, in, the, in the bay there of San Francisco. And what the point of this is that with the thousands and thousands of people pouring into the state of California at the time, you know, or what was to become California, the state of California, um, there was a tremendous need for raw materials. And because of the lack of a road system or rail railroads in, in the West in general, the only way to get things uh, uh, from from one place to another was by ship. And so that's what really started this whole industry of um, transportation with the dog hole ports. And this is just a shot of what a lumber camp would have looked like in the eight, in, a, in approximately the 1860s. I'm not sure the exact date of this, this photograph, but you get a general idea. And what they're doing is they're just, you know, clear cutting the, the virgin redwood forests at the time, which were practically unknown actually until about the 1860s. In fact, the story of their, their discovery has to do with a, with a shipwreck of the frolic, which is a long another story, but it's a really interesting story just the same. Um, and this is just a, a picture of what the typical schooner would look like that plied these waters. Um, there is actually one of these left that can be uh, viewed. It's the C.A. Therer that um, is uh, docked at the San Francisco uh, Maritime National Historic Park there, you know, just adjacent to Fisherman's Wharf. And, it, and for those of you who've who've uh, uh, been out there, they know, you know how, what a fabulous park that is. And I, I, I've been out there many, many times. And oddly enough, I, I toured this boat long ago, long before I ever knew anything about this, this whole topic. And uh, it's really worth seeing. So now I'm gonna just move, start talking about the main uh, subject here, which is the, our uh, current project, which is de deemed the Central Coast Maritime Heritage Project. Um, and this is just a map showing the areas that we, uh, the, the general area, geographical area that we, we were uh, studying. Important to all our work are these wonderful uh, maps, very detailed maps, which we call T-sheets, were created by the Coast Guard as uh, an aid and to uh, maritime traffic in the, the mid eight or the mid 19th century. And they're very, very detailed. And we use them extensively on the Sonoma Coast Project 
and once again had uh, used them for our project on the San Mateo and Santa Cruz County coast. And these, I'm just gonna run a cut through a couple of these, but you can see um, the detail here. And in many cases that it has things such as, you know, even, you know, structures and in and, and towns and, and things that are not just uh, absolutely uh, associated with the, with the maritime landscape. Here's another one, this is Half Moon Bay. 1861. Here's another one, and now we're narrowing in down on Pigeon Point and Onion Nuevo. And this next few shots are just of the general area that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, what we did is we began in the north uh, uh, up by Montera um, and worked our way south looking for uh, uh, a variety of different uh, areas that I had previously researched that I was hoping that we might find some remnants of the um, this maritime tradition. And basically we did not find too much because much of this uh, landscape here has changed due to coastal erosion. And some of the features that we, we were uh, found in the historic record, we could find no trace of. This is just a general shot of, a, of, the, of the area. Um, this is looking uh, south towards uh, Pescadero. You can see the, the Pescadero estuary there on the left. And then just beyond the hills there is the town of Pescadero, which is uh, I'll speak to uh, a little bit later. So um, this whole region was part of an original land grant um, from the 1840s. It was known as, it was at, well, it was a 17,000 acre uh, land grant. It was granted uh, by the Mexican government in 1842. And it was known as Rancho Punta del Año Nuevo, which you are all familiar with. And these next couple of slides are just some historic or this one in particular of, the, of Pigeon Point itself. And this is a very distinctive rock that uh, you, is visible from, from the shore and which uh, uh, was certainly used at one point to help uh, secure some of the schooners um, that were that called upon, the, upon this port. And there it is, as it is, as it looks today. And just another shot of it. And this is a general area of our uh, underwater investigation, which I'll talk about in a little bit here. Uh, you can see how relatively calm these waters are, which was uh, a, a great uh, uh, thing for the for the whaling community. Uh, for This would have been the area where they would have pulled the whales uh, ashore and where they would begin to process them. And this is another slide just indicating where the, the general um, project area was and looking back towards Pigeon Point and where that cove was that we just saw uh, a minute ago. The, uh, the point, Pigeon Point earned its name from a nearby wreck of the clipper ship carrier pigeon that uh, sank in 1853. Uh, in fact, a total of four vessels went down before the lighthouse was built in 1872. Uh, this speaks to the difficult conditions in this part of the coast, known for big swells, heavy fog, and a rocky shoreline. Nevertheless, the area had whales. Uh, the original name for this uh, point was Punta de la Balena, or Well Point, which is what the, what the Spanish called it because of the, the proximity to migrating whales that passed very close to the point as they headed south in their annual migration. And on the right, you can see all the, the, the red triangles are the various wrecks in the years that they went, uh, that they sank. And I believe my, my good friend, Mark Hilkema 
talked at some length about uh, these these wrecks, in particular the the Franklin, the wreck of the Franklin. Just another picture of the general area, looking towards Anya Nueva, which is out there on the on the distant horizon. So these are the these are the four principal areas that we examined during our um, survey. We looked at um, actually there's one missing here. We looked at five different places. Um, the 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 one further south is the one that's missing, and which is in Santa Cruz uh, at the very tip of uh, Monterey Bay, where the Santa Cruz Lighthouse is. Where the if if people are familiar is where the, um, the surf museum is. Um, we identified um, these areas through historic research and then took a, a small team and went out and looked at each one of these. And as I said earlier, uh, we didn't find much uh, at the first two um, just because the alterations to the coast. Um, Which is another indication where pitching point is. This is a um, great photograph um, from the Victoria era of looking back towards the lighthouse. So it's obviously post 1872. I, my guess would be in the 1880s uh, with two of these two women. Um, and what's important about this particular picture is the other structures that you see on either side of the lighthouse itself, um, all of which I believe were related to the whaling that was going on there. Um, one of the uh, things that stands out here is the amount of activity that was going on here. And I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll get into that in a minute here. One of the things is um, this chute, as you, as you can see here in this picture, looks very similar to the ones up on the Sonoma coast. This particular uh, chute, um, I can't tell from this picture but it was either one of two kinds of chute that was developed to transport uh, products to the waiting um, schooners. It's either a trough chute, which I think this is what this is, or a wire chute. The trough chute was simply just that. It was a, a trough that was lowered by wire down to the waiting ship and then using gravity, you know, uh, milled wood, um, uh, dairy products, uh, tan bark, um, and um, uh, firewood would all have been, uh, cordwood they called, uh, would have been uh, loaded onto the waiting ships. And and so you, you can see, you know, how hazardous this, this might have been. And it was, a, it was, you know, something that could be done only at particular times of the year or when the conditions were right. Uh, all these ports are not... Um, you know, very safe um, for certain parts of the year, depending on the on the swell. Um, we did manage to find one remnant of, of another chute. This one is further north of um, uh, Pigeon Point. It was called Gordon's Chute, and uh, we were able to find a little bit tiny remnant of this. Um, particular chute that only lasted for a short time because it was destroyed by a, uh, a storm. So there it is. There's another picture of it, uh, what it looked like um, when it was operational. And what you'll notice is on, on the right is all the buildings up top side, which would have been the areas where the lumber and the various things that were being shipped uh, would have been stored and then transported to the waiting ships below. And one of the ways we, we identified this area was 
as you can see in the foreground, there is a there's a rock in the water, and uh, where a uh, line uh, would uh, was used to secure the, the the bow of the ship, and we actually were able to see the uh, some of the iron uh, remnants of that of that um, point that would have been used to secure the ship. And here it is, what it looks like today. Um, I went out there and wound, found myself down on the on the rocks on the lower left there uh, with the incoming tide. It was a little bit a um, little bit scary, but um, I got out of there in time. There were there were some fishermen out there that were were out there as well, and I kind of warned them because it was not a place you want to be when the tide comes in. And this is a, a slide of the, how steep of the angle would have been for that particular shoot, which is, gives you an idea of the how dangerous this was because of the, the momentum that these the, these things would have had as they they would have uh, got down to the to the ship itself. Also, we we were able to find uh, remnants of this particular uh, pier um, near the town of Davenport, uh, which was constructed as it says here in 1906, and there's just two elements left of it. But um, it was used to uh, load the uh, the ships with the cement for the cement factory, which is still there. Uh, and what you'll notice about this particular ship too is that it's a it's it's both part sail ship and uh, uh, steamer. And now moving back on to uh, Anya Nuevo, I mean, excuse me, to Pigeon Point. This is a famous. Uh, photograph by Moybridge of that particular shoot that I mentioned earlier that was operated by the uh, Steel Brothers who ran a large dairy um, uh, operation in uh, and around or centered in uh, at Año Nuevo. They were the some of the biggest dairymen in the state of California and produced thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons of milk and, and cheese for waiting markets in San Francisco. So they had to have some way to get their product to, you know, to the city. And so they had this thing built. And just here's another picture of it from the 1880s. So as part of our project, we spent a lot of time clamoring uh, over these rocks and looking for for the uh, remnants of these these structures that we found, which we found quite a few of on the, in the previous project up on the Sonoma uh, coast, and um, I just have a couple of shots of what what we found. We have these, which I'm sure if you've been out there, you've you've probably noticed. These are probably later. Um, uh, parts of the infrastructure that would have been used to secure the uh, the chute itself. Uh, these are made of cement, so, and it's an early form of cement. So I'm guessing that this is probably was built in the, in the like early uh, 1900s, maybe the early or, or eight, in the 1890s. And here's two more that have fallen from where they were up on the bluff uh, down onto the beach. And if you look closely here, you'll see some of the other remnants of the chute system. On the left-hand side, you can see a series of iron rods with uh, rings on them that would have been used to secure wire that would have held up the chute. On the, uh, that's on the left. On the right, you'll see a series of cement uh, foundations that would have used to support the, the superstructure of the chute itself. And here's just one of the team uh, Good friend, uh, Chris Kimsey, recording some of the infrastructure of this particular shoot. And this is what we did um, extensively up on the Sonoma coast. But in this particular project, this was the only area that we actually found these remnant um, uh, iron rings and, and the uh, cement foundations. And this is a better picture of that area and what you'll see on the left is some of the remnant uh, rings. And then 
what we did is we waited for low tide and we were able to go out and find um, various elements of this of this um, structure out in the, in the water. So now I, I'm, I'm gonna quit talking about that and sort of mention that, or get into the, the topic of the main topic, which is about the Portuguese. Um, the Portuguese immigrants were, um, as, as we mentioned at the beginning, were, you know, um, mostly from the Azores, um, but they, they, they wound up there um, because of the whaling industry uh, that started or that was, you know, centered out of New England and how the Azorean um, people or men got involved with this is that at the height of the whaling industry in the early part of the 19th century to the to approximately the, the mid part of the 19th century, the whaling vessels from New England would often stop in the Azores for water or fuel and, and often to take on uh, new uh, sailors for their whaling ventures and as, as that experience exposed the Azorians to whaling, um, and that's how they initially learned the, 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 the art or the skill of, of you know, becoming whalers. And what often happened is that they would get aboard these ships and return to the uh, to United States and never come back. So this was sort of the, the, the initial uh, uh, immigration of the Portuguese people uh, to uh, the United States. And this is just some pictures of where, um, uh, from the Azores themselves. And there they are, just to give you an idea of how far away they were. And, and this was really the result of, you know, the whaling industry having to uh, constantly expand their hunting grounds because they would deplete the whaling populations, you know, as they went. And over time, they had to, you know, keep going further and further away to, to, to make it profitable. And it, in the end, they wound up actually um, having to move um, into the Pacific and then ultimately in, into the, um, the Bering Sea, which was like the last gasp of the whole whaling industry. And here's just a few pictures of the whaling as occurred on the Azores themselves. <clears throat> you can see, notice the ships <clears throat> and how small they are <clears throat> because this is the type of whaling that was going on at this time. This was, you know, um, shore whaling. So in other words, not having a big ship, but small ships launched from, from land that would then go and pursue the whales, which is exactly what happened in California. This is a great picture um, that's really kind of says it all about the era. Um, the caption for this particular um, uh, drawing reads um, that it's a, a man sitting on a, on a hill of gold on his way to California, and he's being towed by a sperm whale. Um, the man who's sitting uh, on, the, on the hill of gold uh, has an umbrella holding the reins of the whale, which is blowing water from its spout. Its spout. And I think this is really sort of telling of what, you know, that whole era was about. Here again, this is just uh, another drawing of, of the whaling uh, going on in, in the Azores. And what you see in the background is the island of Pico, which is very distinctive uh, mountain. This is must be a little bit later, uh, given that 
the whalers are using a um, a gun to fire the harpoon. So that didn't come on until later on. So the whaling uh, in California really was a result of the the migration or the migratory patterns of the California uh, or the gray whales. And this is just a picture to show you what their annual um, journey is like, their annual migration in the winter and the summer. And so as you can see from this, this slide, the whales pass very near um, the California coast um, in both directions when they were headed, you know, to their their uh, uh, winter grounds and to their to the uh, uh, Scalman's Lagoon, um, where they would give birth to their young. And here you see on the left, this is a uh, map of all the whaling stations uh, that developed over the period of about 45 to 50 years. You see here, well, I guess it's almost exactly 50 years according to this graphic um, that existed, you know, um, in California. And what's interesting about this is that how often these whaling um, stations were moved and often they were moved by the same people because as they, as they, you know, overexploited the whales at, you know, various places, they had to move on. And so the whole history of this whaling industry is one of, of, of several um, uh, different uh, companies you know, coming into being and then, and then, and then collapsing and then being re, uh, 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 started again by the same people as they moved from one location to another. And here you, on the on the right, you can see there's a this is a whale uh, um, from that they, it was captured in Long Beach. For those of you who are interested, um, I put this uh, a slide of this book on here. This is sort of the, the definitive study of the shore whalers of California. Um, it's a great book. It's beautifully illustrated, and um, I, it's got pretty much everything you ever wanted to know about that uh, the whaling industry in in California. So in that book, and I and as I found elsewhere, are these wonderful um, drawings. And now we're getting down to the, the this is the actual uh, location at Pigeon Point, and. This uh, quote here is was um, is from a a, um, a traveler who passed through California, and and wrote a book about his his travels, and uh, stopped here to uh, witness the the whaling that was going on at Pigeon Point, and so you can see the ships on the right. Those look very similar to the ones that we saw on the other slide of the Azores, and then on the left you can see the the processing of the whale. And the, at the very top, on the left, on top of the cliff, that's the tripod that would have been where the cut blubber would have been sent or put in and then boiled down into an oil, which was what they were really after. And these are, here's the same picture again on the right and then on the left. And what you see um, is the actual point of Pigeon Point which they, where they would have stationed uh, a lookout uh, during the, the right season to look for, for passing whales. Um, when they did see spouts, they would either uh, light a fire or um, perhaps uh, fire a gun and that would alert the whalers that there were whales in the vicinity and they would race out and try to capture them. It's just another picture, once again, of the same thing. You can see the whales on the right. And you, as you well can imagine, this was extremely dangerous work. Um, and often um, they would, the, the whalers themselves would, would, would um, wind up in the, in the water themselves. Um, I don't know, I don't know about the numbers of people that died doing this, but 
as you can imagine, it was it was very dangerous. Um, so shore whaling, you know, it proved to be a, 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 pro, a profitable, um, and they were, as I showed in earlier maps, they were located in Crescent City, Bolinas Bay, Half Moon Bay, Pigeon Point, as we're looking at Santa Cruz, Carmel Bay, Point Sur, and and elsewhere along the, the coast of uh, California. It was advantageous because, as I said earlier, it was something that was relatively um, easy to do. I mean, in, in terms of moving the, the, the people to where the whales are um, versus the traditional way of hunting whales, which was to be to go to sea for a year to two um, that were funded um, by mer the merchants of, uh, of New England and then you know bring the whales uh, back eventually to uh, to be for the whale oil to be sold, in which the the whales were had to be processed at sea. So this is this is the only picture um, that I could find, and this is the actual some of the actual um, uh, whaling equipment there on the interior of uh, what's called Whaleman's Cove. And what you can see down at the bottom is one of the, 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 the boats that they would use, the small boat. And then up top, um, you can see this platform, and that's what, where the tripods would have been located, where they would have uh, boiled the, the blubber down. And this, this picture is it's the only one I've, I've ever been able to find, and it, it was in a, it's in a restaurant in, in the town of Pescadero, uh, Dwarf's Restaurant, if you're ever in there. It's a, it's a great place to go. And so really the, um, the history of the whaling is, is, you know, is a rather sad affair um, because as time went on, uh, you know, with modernization, the whaling uh, got more industrial, more deadly, and um, ultimately, you know, it, it was a victim of its own success. And what you see here is, is a, mo a more modern whaling boat. And you can see that the, the whale that they've got tied up next to the boat and then the, at, the, at, the, at the bow of the boat, a uh, high powered harp harpoon, which just changed the equation to you know, whaling uh, completely. And then down on the, on the right is a whaling um, uh, processing area that was actually near the town of uh, Monterey, uh, near Sand City. And what they're doing is they're pulling in a, a, a large blue whale <clears throat> up that ramp to, to uh, be processed. You know, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the tragedy of this all too is that <clears throat> often <clears throat> the whales, they would be um, hunted and killed, but there was a short window to get them back to shore to be processed. And if they didn't get them within a certain amount of time, the whale would either float away or sink or wind up, you know, uh, washed up on shore somewhere else. So it's just really a, a terrible, terrible uh, loss, you know, for, for the whales. And um, I've read in various places that a successful season of whaling would be perhaps you would get you know four or five six seven whales in a particular season in which you may have killed as many as 20 or more but you're only to able to bring in you know uh, a third or so of that of the whales that you're actually killed and this is a, a picture i found uh of a dead whale So now getting to the, um, the underwater part of this, um, besides the terrestrial work that we did, we also uh, had some divers come out to see if we could find any remnants of this whaling industry in the water. And what you see here is the area that was examined, or at least attempted to be examined. Um, this team was made up of um, state parks, people, there's a dive team, 
and um, they came as far away as San Diego to participate in this. And unfortunately, um, they only got to dive one day um, when the conditions were uh, suitable. Uh, due to the swell and the surge in this area, the, the water becomes very uh, murky and it becomes, you know, therefore dangerous. And um, they could only uh, get out the uh, one day. They were, they were going to, they had three dives planned, but they were only successful in getting one done. The other thing about this too is, as you most people know, this is an area of, of, of sharks. And so they had to have um, spotters and on the, on the rocks above looking, making sure that, you know, at least, you know, from the surface that there were no sharks in this area. You know, the proximity of, of, of Anya Nuevo and the elephant seal population has been a big um, uh, driver in the number of sharks that are in that uh, visit this area. And in fact, I know that a diver was uh, killed here a number of years ago. And here's just another picture of what the cove looks like on a, on a relatively calm day. And these are some of the things that <clears throat> they were hoping to find. These are um, found down in Southern California near off of uh, Palos Verdes. And there's been a lot of speculation as to what they, what they are. And some people have said that they may represent some kind of uh, anchors you know, for this mysterious Chinese, ancient Chinese fleet that visited California in the, I think it was the 12th or 13th century. Um, you know, there's no real good evidence uh, for that, but um, there are these somewhat mysterious looking rocks that were found in the, in the water down there. And they've been found in other places in Southern California as well. And it's, it's, it's very likely that these were um, simple anchors, you know, drilled rocks, you know, that would have had lines attached to them in which they would have secured the whale uh, in the water uh, before they could pull it ashore. And so these were some of the things that we were hoping to find, but uh, we're not able to, 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 to look very closely. And this is a, as we're getting near the end here, that this is a neat picture of what it, the area looked like uh, probably in the 1880s, 1890s. And you can see all the different activity going on here. There's a, there's a small gauge uh, uh, track leading out to the, to the chute. There's these uh, structures certainly uh, used for uh, storing probably, um, you know, some goods and right, Next to it, you can see the stacks of wood being ready or, or all ready to be uh, uh, sent out on the chute to the waiting schooners. And then moreover, you can see out when you look on the bluffs, you can see some houses um, and there's some barns off in the, on the far uh, uh, center right, which a couple of them are still there actually. And then, and then the road on the way into the point itself, you can see some other stru structures there on the left. So what we did is we went out, uh, the small team, and we did a surface reconnaissance of this entire area to see what we could find, what remnants of the of the uh, of those structures were, and it's very likely that many of them were the uh, residents of the Portuguese community that lived there because when they weren't um, whaling, they were tenant farmers. And there was, a, there was a very wealthy man by the name of Coburn who owned this area, but he was, um, um, he allowed these the Portuguese to live there and farm the land. His name was uh, Lauren, Lauren Coburn. He was originally from Vermont. He purchased the property in 1851. Um, he leased uh, the land uh, um, uh, at attractive rates for mostly for dairy operations and uh, charged them um, only about $100 a year and allowed them to build homes there as well. So this is what I think that we, we found some of the remnants of.
And here's us just walking the fields and you can see kind of some of the flags uh, that we put out. This is the way we, we do things. This is a, a sheet scatter of, of um, historic domestic uh, artifacts that's, you know, relates to those structures that you saw in the earlier picture. And these are just some of the drawings of the things that we found here and there on the on the ground as we as we looked around. And here's some of the domestic artifacts that were located: uh, bits of um, of metal, uh, uh, some shell, some glass. In a couple of cases, we found uh, window pane glass. Um, we actually found some uh, women's um, clothing, uh, clothing items <clears throat> as well that are not pictured here. So all indicative of you know communities that once lived there at Pigeon Point. And that's really it. Um, I would just add that the work is not done out there. We want to go back. We'd like to do some further investigations, some excavations uh, to see if we can uh, nail down better uh, where these structures were and the nature of the Portuguese community um, that lived there. And uh, I should add that there was, or there is a, a large uh, Portuguese community still uh, in the general area, uh, certainly in the town of Pescadero, which unfortunately I don't have any pictures of, but there was, certain traditions that started here and that made their way uh, into the town life of Pescadero, which are still celebrated to this day. And these are just some general references. That's it. And Mark, you're muted. Okay. Uh, Oops. Hello. Oh, now Richard's muted. <laughs> there we go. Oh, Richard, you're muted. Having a little technical difficulty. Um, so if you unmute yourself, Richard, uh, what I was saying is thank you. That was incredible. Um, what I particularly enjoyed, um, and, and you're still muted, Richard, if you look there. Um, and, and fix that. But what I particularly enjoyed was all those historical maps um, that you shared, you the images, there you go, um, that are kind of hard to find sometimes and you put them all in one place for us and that was super cool. So so thank you for all of your research and, and all the sharing. I know um, everybody watching has really enjoyed it too. So, um, we are coming up against one o'clock here, but I think we'll just take time for one or two questions um, from the audience. So if you have any questions, you might post them real quick and we'll try to get to them, but um, not related to the the, the topic of, of the shipping and the whaling, but you probably know about this. Sorry to put you on the spot, but um, it, it kind of behooves us to touch on the lighthouse itself. Right. You know, there, there's quite a bit of um, work going on there. And there was just a number of questions about um, what's the right. status of the restoration there. And can you share one or two um, details yeah. about that? Far, you know? Yeah. As far as I know, it's, it's coming along there. They're, they're really, it's a lot about us, you know, raising the money necessary to complete the restoration I think the last I heard was that they are getting ready to restore the lens, you know, uh, to the lighthouse itself. Um, but there's still a certain amount of um, infrastructure work that needs to go on before they can allow people to get back into the lighthouse. Um, that's the, that was the fear that it was, you know, was dangerous. Um, and that's as much as I know about it. I, I know that they've made progress, but they're, they're, they're still 
you know, uh, trying to uh, ra raise money to complete it. Thank you. Um, great. So, and some people asked, and you kind of shared that this is going to happen, but um, what's the next phase of, of research and, and study in the area? Do you have any um, timeline or it's in, um, in process of being planned? Yeah, it, was, it probably would have uh, already taken place this last summer if it wasn't for the pandemic. Mm. Uh, there, were, there were plans to return to Pigeon Point and, as I mentioned, uh, conduct some limited uh, test excavations you know, in the areas that we identified as being uh, uh, residential. And that would have been in conjunction with UC Berkeley with uh, Professor Wilkie, who is an expert on historic archeology span um, and who was with us when we did the original uh, survey. And um, she's also uh, very interested in the Portuguese side of things. Uh, she's married to a Portuguese man apparently, and she's been to Portugal. Anyway, she's very interested in it. And, um, and I think, I hope that, you know, come next summer that this will continue uh, this project where we'll sort of look more closely at the domestic side of things. And then I, also, I also know that the, um, the diving team wants to return as well, you know, and here again, you know, we're sort of uh, hamstrung by, the, by COVID, but, but I think eventually they'll get back out I know that the divers were very excited to be there and to see what they could find. But as I mentioned, uh, the conditions were only good enough for, for the one dive. And, um, but I know that the, that the, uh, the dive team led by uh, Denise Jaffke um, uh, has plans to return. Wonderful. <clears throat> All right. Well, um, to respect everybody's time, I think we're going to, we're going to stop there. Um, but, you know, I wanted to reflect on, you know, this has been meaningful for me as somebody of Portuguese descent. And um, we're going to be sending a survey to everybody after this event. Um, and I particularly like this um, whole theme because it's highlighting, you know, one of the many communities that make up the Bay Area. Um, and so that's something that we're looking to do. Um, at post with these programs that we're doing is um, highlight uh, different uh, histories of different peoples and their relation to the land and to nature. So we'd love to hear ideas actually from the audience, um, other people who, um, who have that context um, and see about what other topics we could uh, highlight in the future. Um, but I really appreciate you, Richard, and all the work at um, California State Parks to do this research and to educate the public to tell these stories um, so that we could deepen our appreciation and our connection to pay places like Pigeon Point. Um, it's really special what you, what you did for us today, and we appreciate you, and thanks for spending the time. And if any of you want to learn more about your local state parks, you could certainly go to parks.ca.gov, um, learn more there. And with that, we're going to say goodbye for today. We hope you all have a very nice and safe Thanksgiving next week right. and, um, and enjoy your weekend. So thank you, Richard, and we'll see well, you around. Thank you. Good luck with okay. the next phase of work. All right. See you all. Bye.